Welcome back to the morning show here on the Rise News. I am Ade Sua Omoruan. And I'm Rafa Yusseini. Technology is believed to hold a key against poverty and unemployment in the world today. And that is why the digital wealth creation is central to youth empowerment, especially in a country like Nigeria. Well, since we now live in a world that has changed beyond the awareness of so many people, pushing the boundary of global economy towards a decentralized global community is very paramount. And that's why Jeff is a moderator and Nigerian blogger, public speaker, socio-economic and political commentator, and social media expert now joins us to discuss wealth uh, creation. Uh, but before uh, Jeff joins us, uh, the digital space mm -hmm. replete with a lot of opportunities. I mean, when you look at the antecedents, if you look at uh, from the start of the year 2000 to now, if they told you that a blogger will make so much money or there'll ever be any occupation like a blogger, nobody mm -hmm. will believe it. The world has flipped, it's changed. The, 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 you know, it, it's amazing how you can sit in the comfort of your house mm. and make money. That is mind, it's, it's amazing, it's just, mm. it's, just, it's just wonderful. However, there are challenges, I think, that, you know, a young entrepreneur or social media entrepreneur or someone who wants to create digital wealth, you know, will encounter. Yes, all of us boils down to infrastructure. That's true. Whether we like it or not. That's and true. Uh, with the level of unemployment we have, perhaps this is uh, a sector we need to be tapping into uh, at the moment. Well, let's listen to Jafet Omodua's um, TEDx uh, talk uh, recently. Maybe you should take yourself back to primary school now, right? When I was in primary school, I went to a cool primary school. I went to three primary schools, but the last one was very cool. The other two, I'm not going to talk about them. When I was in primary school, they used to bring motivational speakers to our classrooms. And they used to say many things. But one of the things that they always, the major refrain was always that, children, you are the leaders of tomorrow. Children, I'm sure you can remember, you are the leaders of tomorrow. I was one of those people that believed those guys. So in believing them, I was really committed to being that leader of tomorrow. So even at that level, at that age, I used to read, even though, even if I say so myself, I used to top the class every term. My uniform was always clean. I used to have a haircut every week. The other, the other students used to, people at that time, they used to look out for my haircut. I was so committed to being this leader of tomorrow. I was very, very interested in citizenship education. If you remember citizenship education, that was our government at that level. If you were interested in politics, governance, that was our government at that level. I also paid attention to the news. I used to actually read the newspapers, but really I was more interested in the sport news. I followed the Super Eagles in Tunisia, Tunisia 94. I followed the Super Eagles USA 94, I follow Stephen Keshi and his career in Belgium, Daniel Lamokachi and all these other superstars we had at that time. So I believed it. Children, you are the leaders of tomorrow. I believed it. I lived it. One of these days in primary school, I was just with one of my friends and he was like, we were reading a history textbook and there was this picture of King's College Lagos that I had never known anything about King's College Lagos. And the boy told me, Lekon, he told me that his brother was in King's College. <laughs> so I was like, what's wrong with this one? Kilo Shele is, 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 is lying to me. So I was like, that's the school I'm going to. That was my first time of knowing whether there was anything called King's College. But I, it was part of... And Jafet Omojua joins us now from our Abuja studios. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, let me begin by congratulating you on your Shevnin right Scholarship. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you. Great. Um, but you know, uh, before we begin this conversation around the digital economy or creation of wealth uh, through the digital space, let me ask you about the social activist Omojoa. What has happened to him? I mean, um, it's a democratized space. I think everybody has to take responsibility for the kind of country they want. I'm not a supporter of putting the burden of change on individuals, especially when those individuals are private citizens. So I have my own interests now. Um, I need to go to school. I need to write books. 
I need to maybe even find someone I love and get married. <laughs> so I, I continued to engage the conversations on development. But obviously, the person I was seven years ago, we didn't have all these responsibilities is not the same person. I think it's a, it's, it's a collective responsibility. So I'm willing to share that space with as many people as possible. All right, D Jafet, uh, another question comes to mind, and uh, th this is a question on digital wealth creation. Jafet, out of nothing, I pretty much know your story. I know your trajectory way back, uh, UNAB days and the likes, and I have seen how you've created an ecosystem for yourself online, and you've been able to make gains out of it. W what has been the story, and how have you navigated through it? It's a long story, and that's why I wrote the book, Digital, The New Code of Wealth. But essentially, 10 years ago, I realized that I couldn't wait to start a magazine, the conventional physical magazine. And then I started on Mojua.com. And since that time, I've been able to plug myself and my ideas and thoughts to Twitter, to Facebook, to Instagram, and different social media platforms, YouTube. And because of the ubiquity of these platforms, I've found my voice in places I'd never been to and even till now, places I've never been to. And people from those places reach out and say, would you like to share your ideas, your thoughts on Africa, on democracy, on governance, on gender equality, inclusion, different conversations. And I've been privileged to do this in some 44 countries. But I document a lot of this in my book, which comes out next week, Wednesday, uh, Digital, the New Code of Wealth. But it's a long story. But I think I tried a bit of keeping it short in one of the chapters in the book. Mm. You know, when it comes to digital wealth creation, a lot of people have this notion that you know you can attain prosperity and financial freedom from zero to million. Is that truly the story? Can you really, you know, create wealth in the digital space by having nothing? First of all, you can create wealth anywhere without understanding that there is a time factor. So you don't become what you want to be the day you decided you want to be. You, there's a lot of steps to take. There, there are a lot of days to happen, a lot of reading, a lot of connection, a lot of network to be built, a lot of places to go, books to read. But I can say for sure that if you have a master plan, if you have an idea and you commit to making that thing happen, yes, for sure, a lot of people, a lot of young people, not, not so young people, are creating up this year, I think last year, $750 million were invested on the continent in, in an economy that never existed 10, 15 years ago. And these opportunities will only get bigger. And for Nigeria and actually the rest of the continent, one of our biggest ways out of poverty to create prosperity for our teaming population is via that digital space. It's a whole new opportunity entirely. Entire companies are bigger than entire countries in Africa just by building on these same opportunities and platforms. Uh, Jaffet, I'm excited you talked about how this is replete with opportunity. I think it was KPMG recently that released a report that said that the Nigerian tech, uh, technology space has got uh, still more entrance for about 3 million jobs uh, if it's properly harnessed, and the industry could be worth hundreds of billions of US dollars. But Jaffet, a lot of people are saying brain drain is taking all of this away. You know, that people, young people are never really having the pride of place. How can they keen to the digital economy? that the bulk of the money made uh, through digital marketing is made abroad. Uh, Africa is just a little fry in the party. What's your reaction to all of this? And, and how can you, you know, build a formidable digital brand like you have built, Jeff? And a lot of people want, want to know, hear your story and take one or two learnings from them. First of all, the simple answer to the, to the last question is, if you want to learn the story, get the book. But I'm not here to sell the book. I'm here to have a conversation. First of all, Africa has to create the environment for these businesses to thrive. There are a lot of companies that, that, that are Nigerian in nature, but are registered abroad because they trust the legal system, they trust the judiciary system, they trust the government system, they trust the monetary system, they trust the system to protect their investment. Nobody's going to invest in a place where before you wake up in the morning, some government laws, some, some people have come to your office to start demanding some money that was never, like you can't even trace it to any law. So we need to build that environment. And then talking about brain drain, I, I see that for, for Nigeria at the moment, we can't do much about brain drain. We can only find a way to tap into that, the energy of our diaspora. The biggest influx of money for the last maybe 10 years has is, is been our diaspora. Remittances to Nigeria were about $25 billion last year. 
Nigeria didn't make money from any source whatsoever, including oil, as much as $25 billion. I think oil was about $18.4 billion. So we need to, in, in, in the reality of the problem of brain drain, we need to find a way to see, okay, so what else can we do? We can build an economy that our diaspora can trust. And so rather than just send money to their families and their personal businesses, they can begin to see a Nigeria where they can invest in. Because you see, no matter how much you love your country, no matter how much you love Nigeria, if you have a billion dollars, that billion dollars will go in the direction where you can trust that that billion dollars will create more wealth, where you can trust that the judiciary around that economy will protect your business, where you can trust that contracts are respected. These are not things that are exactly there right now in Nigeria. So those, of, those people that are still in Nigeria today, really, they are there primarily because they love the country. Secondly, they don't have maybe the resources to invest elsewhere. I know a lot of Nigerians that have investment in Seychelles, in Mauritius, in Luxembourg, in all these places where they feel like their businesses and, and th their interests are protected. So for the digital economy, Nigeria has to, you know, we have to be intentional about it. Look at the law that was just, that's being mooted in Lagos about charging about, is it $75,000 for bike ride, bike yeah. ride companies in yeah. In Lagos yeah. and 85 dollars for each for each new rider. Laws like that, and I mentioned this in the book, laws like that will kill the industry. China is one of the most prosperous countries in the world. And China is going out of its way as I speak to nurture the digital economy. In fact, they are subsidizing entire cities so that people, young people, businesses, big businesses, small businesses can come into these cities and create wealth. We cannot do things the same way we used to do them and expect that things will change. And this country is desperate for prosperity. We are an no matter what you read in the newspapers, or no matter what you see on TV, we are an extremely poor country. We must be very, very intentional about creating wealth. And the digital economy is a big opportunity to make that happen in the future, starting now. Mm. Indeed. Well, apart from policy and being intentional, uh, let's talk about infrastructure and, uh, you know, structuralizing this um, this space, new and old industries are changing the way they are doing businesses online. But I'm talking about the young Nigerian who's graduated and doesn't have a job and is thinking, oh, digital economy. Yesterday, we listened to um, a ministerial nominee who's from the NCC, Mr. Sunday Dari, and he talked about the broadband in the country. He talked about data. And he says, we are not where we're supposed to be. So infrastructure-wise, is there a role for the government in all of this? Um, but we will, we would uh, come, more, we'll come to talk about this, and you have the opportunity to answer this question about infrastructure uh, when we come back from this quick break. Uh, Mr. Jaffet Omodua, please stay with us. Oh, Welcome yeah. back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. We still have Jaffet Omodua uh, with us from our Abuja studios. Uh, Mr. Jaffet, thank you for staying with us. I was asking before that break, the role of government and infrastructure, because you had talked about policies and being intentional. So would you say, you know, there's more to be done in that aspect? Yeah, most uh, definitely. First of all, is to understand that I think the first thing I would like for the government to do is to change the laws around the laying of fiber optic cables across the country. Because in that sense, the government is literally standing in the way of Nigerians being connected to fiber optics. One of the biggest issues in the world today is the US and China battle for, for 5G. And if there is a third world right, if it, if there's a third world war right now, it's, that's the battle. And it's the very same thing that our laws and our governments are placing a barrier on. Because literally, for you to lay fiber optic cables across the country, you have, to, you have to like sweat it out and pay a lot of money. So government should look at that so that fiber optics can go as far as the villages because this internet is a right. It's not something that should be exclusive to the urban areas of Lagos, Abuja, and, and the other cool two cities in Nigeria. Secondly, it's for government to pay, to be very, very humble about understanding that, first of all, we don't really get this space. What can we do? Because ne most Nigerian governments, if their first interaction and engagement with a new economy, with a new idea, is to find ways to tax it and, and burden people. First of all, understand what are we supposed to do? How can we help these young people? And I don't mean tokenism. I don't mean one program or the other. People come and they give them grants. I mean building a real economy, the root, the shoot, the length, the breadth, something that is sustainable. Look at Apple, look at Google, look at Tencent, look at Alibaba. These countries are richer than most of the countries around the world, and they are still just companies. We can, deal, we can, we can build this in Nigeria. Already, without the help of the government, 
Nigerians are making a lot of dents in Africa. One of the topmost places for investment for the digital economy in Africa is Nigeria, alongside Kenya, South Africa, and the likes of Ghana and, and Tanzania. We can do a lot more with government help, but government help should not come from them trying to tax people down, trying to place barriers, trying to charge and charge and charge and multiple taxes. Let's do better because, look, let's face it, our people are not getting as much as they should from government. So the least government can do, if government cannot help these businesses thrive, the least they can do is at least don't get in the way of these businesses. All right, Javed, I did talk about, you know, developing a viable ecosystem. And I'm coming back to that question, really, because it's very important. Till date, we have a government that doesn't have a technology road. We have a government that doesn't have a technology roadmap in this country. I mean, a technology roadmap, a roadmap for the development of the technology sector. There is no viable roadmap. What should be done about it? It's just a hazard business. I think if you check, really, there probably is but it is not being deployed. I'm sure if you go to NIDA, you would find something. Nigeria is one of the few countries in Africa that actually has laws around data, the sharing of data, the Nigerian data law that I also mentioned in the book. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is actually a roadmap. Whether we're committing and committed to that roadmap is a different thing entirely. And in that sense, I would say every roadmap also has to evolve because it, it's possible that these roadmaps were designed seven, 10 years ago, they have to evolve. They have to look at what's happening around the world. And let's also not make, look, look at the ministerial list that came out, for instance, average age 60. I have, I have huge respect for people that are 60 and above, but I don't think that in terms of building the future, you, you put only 60-year-olds there. So when we're building this roadmap, we must be very intentional about putting people that are playing in this space there. We must also be very intentional about making sure that it is very, very inclusive. I would put teenagers on a group like that because teenagers, there are just certain things a teenager would see or a group of teenagers would be able to think and imagine okay. that a 60-year-old or even a 30-year-old would not be able to imagine. Okay. I would put more women. I would put more young people. And I wouldn't have a problem putting 60-year-olds that have a commitment and understanding of what needs to change for the Nigerian economy okay. to try. Okay, okay. I, I want to react to this, uh, Jaffet. You tweeted, once the list was out, you tweeted and your tweet was rooting for Dr. Isa Patami, the former DG of NIDA, because of what he had done. Admits many other things, like cloud residency, which is a big push currently going on. Would you think that people like this should be able to, you know, push the telecom space and the technology space to the next level in this country. Because I insist with, I mean, it's still, it's still just pretty much in-house work by NIDA. Nothing has been done. Take, for instance, Delilah Aliyu, our heads, another governmental sector that has to do with innovation. We've not really seen anything. We've not heard anything as regards that. So what are, you, what, are, what, are you, what are you pushing as regards that? What do you think people like uh, Dr. Isa Patami that you are rooting for and that you tweeted about that you were supporting in your tweet will do in this sector? I mean, my tweet was with respect to the things he's done before. I don't know what ministry is going to head. I think one of the anomalies of our ministerial nomination process is that you go to the National Assembly, but nobody knows exactly what office you're going to be holding. Nobody knows your portfolio, so nobody knows what kind of questions they're going to ask you, apart from you know, people just singing your praise as to what you've done before. But having said that, no individual can build an industry. You need people from in business, you need people in government, you need the citizens demanding for this kind of industry. So it's a commitment from everyone. So for instance, I think that one of the worst things to happen to the to this digital economy was the appointment of the erstwhile Minister of Communication, um, I think it's something Shitsu, Adebayo Shitsu. I think it was, it was a disaster coming from what um, Mrs. Omobola Johnson had done in that space. But when you get to, when you find yourself with people like that, let's say it happens that we find that set up with, with someone like that again, we cannot just fold our hands and just cry and just say we don't want. We have to find a way to get the best out of them. Because for me, when it comes to relating with Nigeria, I have come to a position where I have decided to be pragmatic. So and what does that mean? There is an idealist position. There are things you just want to happen. There are people that you want to be ministers of this and ministers of that. There is a, there is a person you would rather is your president. There is a person you would rather is your governor. But you're just an individual. You don't have control over those things. 
So when those things you don't have control over happen, you start to ask yourself, so what else can we do? So being pragmatic means that as an industry, as a people, as the enthusiasts in this space, we have to be at the forefront of developing the agenda. Sometimes people just do not know what to do, even though they become ministers. So you have to develop the agenda. You have to find a way to get the agenda to their table. You have to sometimes look for their interest in this agenda, and then you deploy. I don't think that's the idealist thing to do, but I think this is not about idealism now. This is about pragmatism. We just want to fix jobs. We just want to create wealth. We just want more people out of poverty. 98 million, 100 million, and with our birth rate, one of the highest in the world, by 2050, Nigeria and Congo Dira will be housing about 40% of the world's people. Look, we have a crisis on our hands. It's not until people, started, people start dropping dead on the roads that we see. The future looks really, really bleak. And one of the places that would shine lights and make the future much more better than it's looking right now is the digital economy. There are billions of dollars to be created in that space. There are millions of jobs to be created. We just need to open our eyes individually, corporate organizations, and of course, government. Because sometimes when government doesn't do the right thing, they also even block your way from getting the right thing done. So everybody's hands got to be on deck. We've got to see these opportunities. Nothing new has to be invented. We just need to look at what others are doing. Why are they thriving? Estonia, India, Israel, China, America, Rwanda. You know, people are doing these things. We don't need to like let something drop in our head and then have some super ideas. Just look at why are they thriving? Why are these countries doing what they're doing? And then deploy them. But for me, this is not the time to cry for someone or cry for someone that has not been appointed. This is the time to see what we can do with what we've got. Mm. I'm sure you have the solution to some of those answers in your books. But let me just ask you, because um, we see a lot of social media uh, entrepreneurs now, people who monetize their popularity and those who are blogging for profit. But beyond those, are there really opportunities and possibilities in that digital space for Nigerian young people? And how do we sustain this wealth creation? First of all, let me say that social media influencing and any money is the lowest rung of the pyramid of any money on the internet. You become popular, you charge people for your popularity. That's, that's like small. There are bigger spaces to play. You don't even have to be famous on social media to be in that space. You could just create a digital marketing company or an advertising company. You get a chunk of the money, you hire influencers, and you deploy your agenda or campaign. So there are different chains for different people. You don't even have to have a Twitter or Instagram or Facebook account to, to be this person. The other thing is you could create an app or a project, a new project. Maybe you, you, you try to help a particular state maximize the movement of the vehicular traffic and things like that. There are things you can create and then get people to fund it. Um, there are people to learn from. We, it's this country that Flutter with came from. Um, it's this country that we have Andela. We have, we have um, sorry, this, these names are like going out of my head, even though I wrote about them. Softcom, Ayowo. Um, there's, a, there's a particular one I'm trying to remember, Andela, Flutterwave, a lot of them actually, I'm sorry, the, the names are not coming to me right now. Just Google startups from Nigeria, thriving startups from Nigeria, and you will see a huge chunk of numbers. You read about those that have done it, what, what did they do right, what did they do differently, how did they get to attract funding internally and, and from outside the country, and then you plug yourself to it. The other side of it is, there are people that already have their businesses. You're a photographer, you're a fashion designer, you're a shoemaker. Hello, Anything you could be, Hello, by plugging your, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Can you hear me? Mr. Yeah. Jaffet, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, we My wish pleasure. you the best. We wish you the best in your new yeah. endeavors and in school as thank well. You. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jaffet.